About 10 years ago, I moved from Australia to the US, and I noticed some strange things that happened to me. As soon as I moved, I became a slightly different version of myself. I thought a little bit differently, I felt a little bit differently. It was a kind of strange experience. And at first, I assumed that I'd just moved away from home. So this was just the new me. I'd matured, I was far away. But as soon as I came back and spent just a little bit of time in Sydney, I went back being, to being the old me. And I was curious about this. This is kind of an interesting idea, because I'd always assumed there was one central version of who I was, and that that central version would never really change, that I had a personality. But as I went back and forth over the years, I realized that that just wasn't true. And I started to wonder whether this was just about me. Maybe I was particularly malleable. Maybe I was just that kind of person who was impressionable, and so I changed as I moved around. And so what I decided to do was I went back to grad school, and I wanted to run an experiment to see, first of all, whether this might be true of other people as well. But not just that, whether smaller things, not just big things like moving from country to country, could have the same sort of effect. Maybe even really small changes in the world around us could make us different people. And that would really throw us. We'd have to think about ourselves as multitudes rather than just one person. And so I ran an experiment. What I did was I gave people four different pieces of jewelry. You can see them here behind me. And there were two different sets of jewels. And I asked people to estimate how much the jewels were worth, which is a strange task. People aren't very good at this. They're not all professional jewelry evaluators. But here you see the four jewels. Now, I made one small change for a second group of people. I switched out the right-hand fourth jewel. And so for that group, I saw this one. You can see it's a crucifix. Now, these were religious Christians. Now, what I assumed was that if we are malleable, perhaps reminding us of different aspects of our characters would change how we behaved, how we felt. And so what I did was, after these people had completed this strange task and done very badly at estimating the value of the jewelry, I gave them another task. And this was designed to measure their honesty. Now, one of the, the central tenets of religion is that you should be honest. And if you're a religious person, being reminded of your religion should make you, just briefly, perhaps a bit more honest. And so I gave these people a very cleverly designed scale from the 1960s, and social psychologists designed this, and it had items like this. Now, what you'll notice about these is there's, there's one answer that makes you look good, and then there's one answer that's honest. These are the dishonest answers. So if you say, I'm always willing to admit when I make a mistake, you're basically lying. Because sometimes you do, but often you don't admit when you make a mistake. If you say it's false that sometimes people who ask favors of me irritate me, that's also a lie. If you say I'm always courteous, even to people who disagree with me, that's nonsense. And so we gave people this long list of items to see how honest they would be, and we found something pretty interesting. Now, remember, these are fairly religious Christian people, so reminding them of religion should make them more honest, and that's what we found. Just briefly presenting them with this cross, this crucifix, had this strange effect. When they got this set of jewels, they were dishonest about 44% of the time. This doesn't speak well of the human race. <laughs> if we were dishonest 44% of the time in every context, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But the good news is when you present them with the cross, they're only dishonest 29% of the time. And so there is this different version of them that came out when we presented them with this reminder of religion, of being a good person. Now, not, we weren't the only people who were doing this. There were some people around the world who had similar questions. Around the same time, across the Atlantic from New York, there were some people in Newcastle in England who were doing something quite similar. They wondered whether they could increase honesty in a different context. They had a break room at the university, and what they had was a, a pot of coffee, and they said to people, as you take coffee, please put a couple of pence in the jar so that we can replenish our funds. And you saw that people are dishonest a lot. Well, they were, they were constantly dishonest here. The, the jar remained empty, and the supply of coffee dwindled. And so they thought, well, we can't afford a surveillance camera. That seems extreme, given that we're talking about a matter of a few pence. But what they did was they changed the picture that appeared just above the jar every week for 10 weeks. So one week, they would show a picture of flowers. Nothing threatening about flowers. People were just as dishonest when there were flowers above the jar which is a surprise to no one. But the next week, they switched the flowers out for a pair of human eyes. <laughs> and lo, the jar was full. And so they kept doing this. They thought, well, maybe this was an honest week. Maybe it was Lent. Who knows what was going on? So they went back to the flowers. No more money. They went back to the eyes. The jar overfloweth. 
And so on for 10 weeks, back and forth, flowers, eyes, flowers, eyes, up till the 10th week, when they had realized that just presenting this pair of eyes, you know, this is a room filled with stuff. The eyes made people do basically donate three times more to this honesty jar, which is pretty ridiculous, right? I mean, this is a subtle cue, and they became a different version of themselves. You'd think of honesty as something that's fixed, and yet it's not at all. Now, honesty is not the only trait that this applies to. There's some fascinating experiments on others, and I'm actually going to ask for your participation on this one. You can see the letters of the alphabet here. This is an experiment run by a Belgian psychologist in the mid-1980s. What I want you to do is I want you to look at these letters and do something you've probably never done before, which is to think of your favorites. Pick maybe, say, three, four, or five favorites. I'll give you just a few seconds to do that. Just look at the letters. OK, now I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if one of the letters you chose at least was the initial of your first name, the first letter in your first name, or the first in your surname. <laughs> and 2,100 hands went up. OK, that is a demonstration of how much you think of yourselves. So it's good. Self-esteem is important. As psychologists, we know that. But this has really interesting implications. So we name lots of other things as well. We know, for example, Cyclone Tracy hit Darwin in 1974. We know that we name other things as well, like cyclones. So cyclones in the US, we name hurricanes. Katrina and Rita were two of the most devastating in the 2005 Atlantic hurricane season. And as hurricanes and cyclones pass through, one of the things we try to do is get aid for the people who are affected. That's not always easy to do. People don't like parting with their money. But researchers found something fascinating about this. They found that people who happened to share the initials with these hurricanes were way more generous. So Ken's and Kim's and Kevin's were all about donating to Katrina. Ron's and Rita's were great about Rita. In fact, they donated between two and a half and even three and a half times more to those hurricanes than the ones that had names that did not match their initials. And that probably isn't a huge surprise given what I've just shown you, that you have this strong attraction to your own initials without even realizing it. It's probably nothing you've th thought of before. This has also very interesting implications for policy. It shows that we can switch generosity on a very big scale, you can make people more or less generous by being smart about how you name hurricanes. So if we look back at these letters, we have the letters here. I'm going to show you the, the relative representation in Australia of names that begin with each letter. You can see here we have lots of J's and M's and R's and S's and A's and D's. Um, J and M are the most common, mainly because a lot of male names begin with J. We've got a lot of Johns and Jameses and Jacks and Jasons. A lot of female names begin with an M. Marys, Melissas, and Maries, and so on. And so those are dominant. Now, if we know that people give more when the initial of the hurricane happens to match their own initial, why don't we use this? Instead of going down an alphabetical list, which is the way they do it now, why don't we name hurricanes a little more strategically, or cyclones? In fact, I did an analysis, and just by changing the names of hurricanes, we could attract every decade $100 million more in aid at a cost of precisely zero. That's a pretty good return. So this is sort of an interesting idea, and it also suggests that it, on a very big scale, not just honesty, as we saw earlier, but also generosity is very flexible, and it's flexible at a huge scale. This suggests we should do all sorts of things. We should name our hurricanes John, perhaps Mary, perhaps Bill Gates, Oprah. <laughs> Using the right naming approach, we could attract many, many more dollars in aid. Now, I've looked at generosity and honesty here. Let's look at one more dimension. This one will be interesting to those of you who have ever gone on a date. Should be a fair few of you. All right, so now in an online dating research, there are many people who wonder how you can get an edge. How do you get ahead of your competition? One of the things that we know about online daters is they tend to be pretty open-minded. That's because they're going online to try and find someone who they want to settle down with. If you're not open-minded, it just doesn't make sense to do that. So in the US, for a period of 12 months, some researchers asked both women and men, actually, but we'll focus on women for a moment, to wear different colored shirts for two months each. So each shirt, six colors, two months each, a year. And every two months, they had exactly the same picture, as you see here, but they switched the color of their shirt. And I wondered, could we change how open-minded the daters were when they looked at these profiles? Could we make them more interested in going on dates with these women? And so what they did was they measured the response rates. And then they looked across the year whether there was an even distribution depending on shirt color. And there wasn't. They found about 15% of the responses came when the women wore black. 
about 16 when they wore white, big uptick for red, and back down again for yellow, blue, and green. People are much more responsive to the color red. It's a good tip for those of you, get a competitive advantage. <laughs> Wear red everywhere. Soon everyone in the world will be wearing red in every context. <laughs> so you can make a data more open to the idea of going on a date with you by wearing red, even though most of the time you probably won't be wearing red. That doesn't make a lot of sense. You should think that open-mindedness, if you like someone, that shouldn't really change much. And yet here, open-mindedness is tethered to the color that this person happens to be wearing. It's another striking effect. Now, that matters quite a lot. If you're just looking for one soulmate, and that's how most people go online, although there are all sorts of uh, alternatives, every thousand people who look at these profiles, you'll get 40 to 60 additional hits if the person is wearing red. And I should say this is true for guys, and it's true whether you're looking for a male partner or a female partner. It's just something about humans and how they work. The rush of blood to the face makes us think of, uh, of romance, basically. So this really does matter. And so I've shown you that even though you may think you have one fixed personality, very subtle cues can change everything. They can make you more or less honest. They can make you more or less generous. They can make you more or less open-minded. So though you might say you're somewhere like a five, sometimes you'll be a one in the wrong context. Sometimes you'll be a nine. And you'll vary dramatically depending on these very minor cues. So there are multitudes of you. To say that you have a personality makes some sense, and there is a kernel to who you are. But at the same time, you will vary dramatically depending on the context. Thanks very much.